I'd like to tell a little story about uh, Eli Whitney. He was the manufacturer, although some people think he borrowed ideas from others, but uh, responsible for the development of the cotton gin. He headed south from New England in 1792 and uh, was um, financed by a plantation owner, a lady named Catherine Green. And uh, she funded his research, and he developed this. Now, there was a kind of cotton that grew along the coast that was fairly easy to separate from the seeds. But the cotton that grew inland had these sticky green seeds, and they were very difficult to separate. It was an exceedingly slow process. Once this cotton gin, which was a kind of a combing system of pulling the seeds away from the cotton, once it was developed, um, it drastically increased the ability to process the cotton. I think from 1800, uh, cotton production doubled like every decade or something like that because of the improvement of the cotton gin. Well, our story is a modern story, not uh, one back in the days of Eli Whitney, but his first cotton gin was built outside of Augusta, Georgia, near Waynesboro, Georgia. And uh, the cotton gin was owned by a distant relative of Eli Whitney. Well, my friend Scott, uh, at that time, he was living a sinful life and uh, was uh, drinking too much and and uh, living in a godless way. And he ended up uh, being in a terrible accident because of his drinking. And uh, it sobered him up. And through this process, Scott ended up getting saved. He as he recuperated, he, he wondered how he could ever go back working in the cotton futures business where he had previously been employed. Because uh, to his mind, largely it was a, a, a legalized form of gambling. And uh, the people that he worked with were very ungodly. When he returned to work, however, um, the first week he was there, uh, he heard a bunch of his fellow employees laughing about the owner of this cotton gin down in Waynesboro, Georgia. And the reason they were laughing was because this man, after the farmers had processed uh, their cotton through his gin and uh, weighed it on the scales, he discovered that his scales were off to his advantage. And so he had cut checks. No one else knew what was going on, but he had cut checks for all these farmers that had used his scales. And uh, everyone was laughing like it was money in his pocket. What was he thinking? Well, Scott went to the phone and he called this man in, in Georgia. And he said, you know, uh, we're up here. I think it was in Memphis. I'm not sure, but somewhere at some distance from Georgia. And he said, everybody's laughing about you because you cut these checks for all these farmers and Nobody knew it was, it was free and clear money for you. And the fellow said, well, um, it wasn't my idea to do it. Oh, I see. Yeah, no, I don't own the business. Oh, I see. Yeah, God owns my business. It was his idea. And Scott said, can I work for you? And that's how he ended up moving uh, down to, to Georgia. And, uh, and, you know, as I thought about that, that here's a man in this little community, sort of in the middle of nowhere, seeking to be faithful to the Lord. And it goes back to the scripture, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Now, there's nothing second on the list. It's just the first. If you have a list of priorities, you can have that as long as there's just one thing on the list. And the whole idea is this. When people say, why do you work? Why do you uh, mend trousers? Why do you pour concrete? Why do you grow corn? Well, a guy's got to live. You got to make money to live. That is a poor reason to spend most of your life. The better reason is to say, well, I do it to glorify God. And if that's the answer to the question, why do you do this? You will never be tempted to fudge in order to make more money. Because you know it does not accomplish the purpose that you have set in your heart. 
to glorify God. Recently, I was talking to the fellows in the prison, and they said, well, you know, it's it's a little easier for you uh, to seek to do the will of God because you get to make choices. We are told to do everything, when to eat and what to eat and when to go to bed. Everything is organized for us. We really don't have a lot of choices. Well, I said, you know, the majority of people in the Roman Empire didn't have choices either. Seventy percent of them were slaves. But Paul said that the slaves mucking out the stall for their owner could adorn the doctrine of Christ, not by choosing to do this or that, but choosing how to do this or that, so that whatever I'm doing, washing dishes at the sink or helping someone or working, it, it elevates what I do to a new level. I am doing it to the glory of God. I'm doing it to advance his kingdom. And so if that's the case, then even though I am being told what to do, I can do it in a way that is honoring to the Lord. And so here is this man hidden away who does what honors the Lord. He did all for the glory of God. And that influence rippled across the country and changed the life of a young man who saw it was possible to be in the cotton business and be there for the glory of God.